fly from South Carolina, benefiting the local economy and the environment, investing sustainability. My name is Sherry Q. I'm the executive director of China General Chamber of Commerce, and it's my pleasure to emcee today's event. Today's event is co-hosted by China General Chamber of Commerce USA and Sun Fiber. If you are not familiar with CGCC, we are an independent, non-partisan, non-governmental chamber of commerce with a mission to create value, generate economic growth, and enhance cooperation between the U.S. and China business communities. We provide a broad range of programs, services, and resources to over a thousand multinational corporate members across the United States. Today, the co-host Sun Fiber is a leading manufacturer and a supplier of filling RPSF for home textile and furniture industry. On behalf of CGCC, I want to thank Sun Fiber for their support of today's event. Let's give them a quick round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sun and her great team. Today's event is being broadcasted live from South Carolina by our Zoom platform. Whether you are attending today's event in person or online, you will have the opportunity to ask our distinguished speakers questions following each panel discussions later in the event. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Mr. Li Suosheng. Mr. Li is the vice chair of CGCC and the chair and the general manager of China Construction Bank, New York. Mr. Li, open your remarks, please. Uh, thank you, Sherry, for your kind introduction. Distinguished uh, Secretary Lightsey. Mr. Long, our great co-host, Ms. Sun, dear CGCC members and friends, good morning. Actually, I'm not very good at making long speeches, so I, I'll try my best to make it short, okay? Uh, thank you for being here with us today in the incredible South Carolina. The rich history of the state nurtures its prosperous economy from agriculture to advanced manufacturing. We are also excited about the opportunity to learn more about potentials here for business investments and expansions. On behalf of China General Chamber of Commerce USA, I'm proud to have convened the distinguished guests from the state government, institutions, businesses, and media. On this special occasion to discuss how Investing in sustainability would benefit the local economy while contributing the, to environmental protection. I'd also like to express my sincere gratitude to our member company, Sun Fiber, Ms. Sun and her team for all the support and efforts they put in today's event. Back in November, US and China issued a joint statement pledging to bilaterally confront the climate crisis and to cooperate on the green economy that will benefit citizens in both countries and of the globe. On the local economy and business level, the green economy is an alternative version for growth and development, one that can generate economic outcomes, improve people's lives, as well as environmental and social well-being. This is the reason why CGCC is hosting this important event today, demonstrating and promoting how sustainable strategies advance the economy, social and environmental triple bottom line will greatly help business leaders and stakeholders better understand the benefits of sustainability initiatives. Making businesses more sustainable starts with being aware of the issue at hand and understanding just how important it is to make changes. And we are glad to see the business community embrace green transformation. In our 2021 business survey report on Chinese enterprises in the US, over 60% of respondents have developed or are in the process of developing long-term strategies 
for a sustainable, low-carbon future. Corporations, financial institutions, and many of our organizations have also begun leading the way by developing, supporting, and enhancing programs based on new ESG standards and promoting the financing of green bonds and green energy projects, both at home and abroad. With a mission to create value, general, generate economic growth, and enhance collaboration between our business communities, CGCC will continue to serve with determination and creativity towards strengthening the cooperation between the US and China on tackling important issues such as climate change and transitioning towards green renewable energy. I greatly look forward to an insightful and productive discussion about opportunities and solutions to these and other major challenges we are facing today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for the remarks. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster. While the governor couldn't be here in person with us today, he did record some brief remarks for us. Hello, I'm Henry McMaster, and I want to add my welcome to the Chamber of Commerce CEO Roundtable hosted by Sun Fiber. From our booming economy to the natural beauty of our state, all can see that South Carolina is a shining example of the progress and prosperity which ensue when commerce, conservation, and visionary leadership intersect. So thank you, Sun Fiber, for hosting this great event. Enjoy the roundtable. Okay, now it's my honor to introduce the Secretary of Commerce of South Carolina, Mr. Harry Lexi, to give us a special remarks. Thank you very much. Certainly my uh, honor and privilege to welcome you and the China uh, General uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, to South Carolina. We are very excited and honored for you to be here. So thank you, Ms. Sun, for your role in bringing, bringing these folks here from around the country uh, to our state. Uh, the relationship between South Carolina and, and China is a very deep one and rich one. And we appreciate uh, the many companies uh, from China that have invested in South Carolina and created jobs uh, for our citizens and have brought their, their technology uh, to our state. And uh, that is certainly uh, a very, very important uh, relationship uh, between our state and the country of China, and we, we are, are happy to welcome you here. Uh, in addition to the num great number of companies uh, from China uh, that have invested in South Carolina and created jobs, uh, China is actually the number three uh, trade partner uh, with uh, the state of South Carolina. Uh, right after Germany and Canada. So the relationship is a very important one in, in both directions, and we're very, very excited about that as well. Uh, the other part of why we're here this morning is obviously to talk about uh, sustainability and how important that is. And as the governor mentioned in his remarks, the state of South Carolina is a beautiful state, and, and I think the citizens of the state of South Carolina feel uh, very naturally uh, connected to our environment because of of our natural beauty. And so uh, sustainability is um, something that comes uh, very uh, naturally to uh, all South Carolinians. And we're very proud of that. Uh, we have over 300 uh, companies in the state of South Carolina uh, that are involved in recycling uh, in one way or another. And uh, the kind of things that can be done, uh, just like uh, the great example of Sun Fiber uh, where they're taking uh, plastic bottles that would normally be in our waste stream and recycling those and creating uh, useful purposes for those 
uh, is an incredible example of the kind of things and the kind of creativity, uh, the technology that's being brought to bear uh, as we, as, as a globe, as all the countries of the world try to work together uh, to, to lessen our imprint uh, on our natural environment. So this is very important uh, for us as our state. Uh, we at the Department of Commerce are very excited about the, the future of sustainability in South Carolina as a business sector that we want uh, very uh, aggressively to develop uh, within our state and, and look for companies like Sunfiber uh, to do uh, very exciting things uh, to help us uh, as we go forward from here. So thank you very much uh, for this. I look forward to participating uh, in this morning's activities and thank you again for visiting South Carolina. Thank you, Secretary, um, for you know take time out of your busy schedule to speak with our audience today and to join us today. So now I'd like to hand it over to the CEO and the President of Bank of China USA, Mr. Hu Wei. Mr. Hu, please. Thank you. Um, Good morning, friends. I'm Jeremy Smithson, and our colleagues are from Sun Fiber, uh, Jeremy Legan, and actually uh, Ms. Long, and our friends from South Carolina, and also uh, Ch uh, Chester County. Uh, their CGCC uh, colleagues, uh, good morning. It's really my great honor to join you in South Carolina and speak on behalf of the Bank of China USA at this forum. Uh, today, uh, as uh, Mr. Lee mentioned, I would like to talk a little bit about, about the um, investing in sustainability. Uh, we believe it's a cross-cutting theme that is quite relevant in our times. As we know, the term ESG, or environmental, social, and governance, has gained much traction from Wall Street to Main Street over the years, and it speaks to all of us. As we look to the future, it becomes quite clear that sustainable development requires us to have a great picture and deeper understanding of ESG. And there's a need for great adoption of ESG criteria into sustainable business decisions from ballrooms to deal rooms. In short, we need to do well and do good. So what does ESG mean, especially to the banking industry where I'm, I'm working for? As the financial institutions come to grips with environmental pillar or the letter E, Many have moved down the path towards green finance and less carbon footprint. A recent Bloomberg um, forecast shows that as the world is transitioning uh, towards greener and cleaner energy resources, solar and wind will power half of the, half of the globe by 2050. Banks are major in enablers in financing renewable energy investments for most of those projects are financed by the syndicated commercial loan market. As green finance delivers on the environmental agenda, many banks are also committed to sustainable financing for the social well-being, or the letter S. Given the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the global value chain and economy, socially responsible banks like our, ourselves are shifting toward a mindset of putting people as planet first. During the pandemic, digital financial inclusion developed quickly as banks sought to make financial services more accessible to the underprivileged groups and local communities. Many banks offer loan relief and other programs to those customers hard hit by the pandemic and its economic, economic fallout. If you look at the corporate governance of banks or the letter G, it actually goes beyond shareholders' rights. It touches every aspect of how banks interact with its shareholders, such as employees, customers, competitors and regulators. Initiatives such as the anti-bribery and anti-corruption or APAC program, or diversity, equity, and inclusion or DEI program have come to the forefront. Therefore, good governance is a hallmark for good banks. Uh, as a Chinese bank has been, opening, uh, has been operating in the US for more than 40 years, and also as the board chairman company of China Chamber, Chi uh, China, uh, Chamber uh, Commerce, a Bank of China USA, like many business leaders represented here, has witnessed the fast evolving ESG landscape and its impact on banks and beyond. 
Although this is my first visit to South Carolina, I'm quite impressed that the state is leading the clean energy initiative in the US, home to four nucle uh, nuclear power plants and power over half of the state's electricity. South Carolina is also entered with wind and solar energy in the region. What's more, when local and state governments come up with economic friendly policies, incentivize renewable energy, and encouraging investments in green and sustainable projects that work for economy, environment, and society, like what we have witnessed for the um, sun fibers. So in the face of sustainability, I believe South Carolina acts with urgency, commitment, and great, in great intent. I strongly believe that the state has a lot to offer and more to discover and learn during this trip. So in summary, at BOC USA and also at and CGCC, we see both challenges and promising opportunities in the ESG systems. As a prominent voice in the US business community, we will work tirelessly to meet the carbon neutrality goals and implement sustainable and green finance initiatives. At the same time, I believe there will be a lot of possibilities for us to work with the great state of South Carolina on financing, clear energy, and social programs for common good. We will work together with you for a better, more sustainable, and more prosperous future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hu. Now, next speaker is actually a note friend of many of you, Mr. Robert Long, the director of Chester County Economic Development. Mr. Long, please. Oh, yeah, you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. This is a, a really honor for us in Chester County to host this event today. Uh, also delighted that I guess my, my boss, Dr. Frederick, uh, is here today. Uh, uh, he, he is our highest elected official. We are delighted uh, that you know he, this is an important event for him, an important event for Sunfiber, one of our uh, larger industries here in Chester County. And we're delighted that he was able to join us this morning. And we also have Miss Clinton here. She's with our local Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Brooke has uh, been a tremendous asset to us on a number of occasions. Uh, I know we just had the big teacher appreciation event, which is a fantastic event. That is one of the many events that they do here to support the industry in the local community. Uh, I would like to just take a kind of a little bit of moment of kind of personal privilege to talk a little bit about Chester County. And for some of you, this is your first time in South Carolina. For some of you, this, you know, this may be your first time in Chester. So just a kind of a quick orientation of kind of where we are. Um, we are pretty fortunate that we are actually part of two uh, regional economic development organizations. One is the five county I-77 region, which is the Interstate 77 from Columbia up to the state line with North Carolina. But we are also part of the 15 county Charlotte Regional Business Alliance, uh, which is uh, fantastic for us because for us, uh, being a community that sort of straddles the two states. Uh, but at the same time, Charlotte actually is the largest metro in both Carolinas, both North and South Carolina. And we are delighted to sort of to be the Southern boundary of, uh, of Metro Charlotte as well. Uh, the one thing I'll tell people is we're in a, I think we were pretty small. We are only 32,000 residents. Uh, but if you look at our uh, labor draw, you know, 45 minute drive time, uh, uh, we generally can demonstrate that we are able to meet the labor force needs of uh, any community, you know, any company that wants to come to our community. Uh, for most locations in our, along our Highway 9 Industrial Corridor, about 1.3 million residents uh, as part of that labor shed. And we actually tap into a little bit unusual in that we actually are able to tap into two metros, both Metro Charlotte and about half of the north side of Metro Columbia. So from that perspective, we're in a great location. Uh, I will say my uh, uh, predecessors, Ms. Carly Sedin and others, have done a really good job of preparing us for opportunities. We have over 3,000 uh, acres of industrially zoned property. Uh, we have over a dozen certified sites, uh, the most of any uh, county in the state of South Carolina. So when we do have those opportunities as a small county, uh, hopefully we are able to uh, uh, you know, stay in the hunt long enough for those decisions to be made, uh, and we're fantastic. Uh, we are historically a, a very heavy textile community. That is sort of part of our heritage. I told people manufacturing is our heritage, but it's also our future. Uh, we are actually the number one manufacturing community in all of Metro Charlotte. Over 46% of our workforce is in manufacturing. And if you look at manufacturing job growth, uh, we are actually, same thing, number one in the region. Uh, so it is an opportunity for us to continue to grow that 
uh, you know, that workforce in our community and in our industries. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the industries that we have here. Uh, we're delighted that Sunfiber uh, made the decision many years ago uh, to acquire one of our existing business and they have continued to grow and expand uh, that operation here. Uh, one of our big successes last year was E&J Gallo Winery. They're the world's largest winery. And we are delighted that they're locating, building a facility as we speak right now in the Fort Long community near the Lancaster County line. Uh, I think phase 1A is supposed to be open in October of this year. Um, but we have some fantastic industries. And one of the things you will notice, we have several, I guess, uh, international companies such as GT Tire here. Uh, and I think with us and the proximity uh, to the airport, there's some opportunities for us to continue to grow foreign direct investment here in Chester County. We have a couple of unique assets I'll just point out real quick. One is the LNC Railroad. Uh, that is your short line railroad that was built by Springs Industry, which was the largest of our textile industries. Even though the textiles are gone, that railroad was acquired by Gulf and Ohio. And what makes it unique is that we actually are able to connect back both the Norfolk Southern and CSX here in Chester County. Uh, that is a very unique attribute for both Carolinas. And I tell people only about 10% of projects, you know, statewide need rail. But if you do need rail, uh, why would you not want to have CSX and Norfolk Southern compete for that business? Uh, and it has served us well. For us, it's a uh, over 30% of our projects are rail driven. And if you look at actual announcements, it's probably over 60% of our projects have been rail driven. And it is an engine for us as a community. We also have one of only five natural gas authorities. So uh, what, at the end of the day, what it means is if you are a heavy gas load, like a glass plant, and, or you have ovens and you're using uh, have furnaces and things like that, we can be very competitive on our gas rates. And then if you look from an incentives uh, structure, uh, South Carolina goes from a tier one being a very developed to a tier four underdeveloped county. We are a tier four county. We're the actually only tier four county on I-77. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be a tier four for very long. We, we've had some great success uh, in our way, but while we do have that tier four status, we can really maximize the incentives uh, for our, our community. But this is the kind of quick snapshot that kind of shows you the rail and how it situates. For us, we have this wonderful 20 mile long divided four lane industrial corridor and that rail with the short line railroad LNC kind of parallels that to the south. And then you can sort of see where the Norfolk Southern and the CSX lines are. And then this just kind of gives you a snapshot of where we are. And as I mentioned, we are the only tier four county. So from a, a value of the incentive for a company located in our area is basically the, the highest that you can do in the state of South Carolina. Uh, as I mentioned, we are, I think, a great target for foreign direct investment or FDI. Uh, one of our biggest assets we have in the region is Charlotte Douglas International Airport. It is an engine for uh, international investment. For us, it's only a 40 minute short drive away. Uh, it actually just went up. It's actually now the fifth busiest airport in the world in terms of aircraft movement and actually seventh business as when you look at passenger traffic. That is a huge asset for us to have in our such close proximity. And then one of the, the biggest driver of this the heat of South Carolina as a whole is the Port of Charleston. For us, it's a, a less than a three hour drive away, uh, but you can under, not underestimate the value of the Port of Charleston. And of course, uh, for speaking of Chinese foreign direct investment, here's just a kind of snapshot of where that investment lies in the state of South Carolina and within the Charlotte region. Uh, if you look at the uh, top Chinese uh, project is uh, Volvo cars down in the, uh, the low country in the Charleston area with 1500 employees. Uh, but if you look at that top five list, uh, you have Sunfiber. So we're so delighted that Sunfiber is in that, you know, that list of uh, growing Chinese investment and continue to uh, add jobs and uh, quality jobs to our community. And I will say, you know, not all companies are, uh, I call community minded, uh, but Sunfiber is. They're very involved with our local chamber of commerce. They're very involved with some of our local uh, nonprofits. Uh, that's the one thing nice about when you attract a company uh, is when they get engaged in the community, it does really benefit all of the community. And we're so delighted that Sunfiber uh, is engaged in our community, engaged with our nonprofits, engaged with our chamber of commerce. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, same thing for us, uh, not all companies are as community minded as Sunfiber, so we're delighted for that. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or I'm happy to sit down and let the next speaker come up. Sure. 
Um, I can give you some off, off the top of my head. Obviously, I can get you more specifics. Uh, we're very fortunate. We are most of our, uh, our our county is served by Duke Energy. Quite a bit of their power is actually a series of dams on the Catawba River. The Catawba River is our our eastern boundary of our community, um, and uh, I think right now uh, Duke is over sixty percent of their uh, uh, their energy is actually produced from a carbon neutral source. Um, so I know hydro is important, uh, but I know they're I know we've uh, you know they're continuing to look at solar. They're continuing to look at wind. I know we had this discussion with uh, Duke yesterday about this, uh, and I know for us personally, we have a couple of uh, you know solar projects that are kind of looking at us, us as a community. Uh, for us, the one thing nice about them is they can typically, uh, you know, as long as they have access to a transmission line, they, they don't need need otherwise they don't need infrastructure. So they can sort of be a very remote location. Uh, they don't really uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know need water, they don't need sewer, they just need access to a transmission. Uh, and I know as a, as, a, as a company, Duke is very committed to continuing to grow that carbon neutral uh, you know, uh, portfolio uh, for power generation. But at the same time, I can, we can get more specifics for you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert, for the very informative presentation. So now it's time for our keynote speaker of the day. Please join me in welcoming CGCC Board of Director, President and CEO of Sun Fiber, Ms. Ya Sun, Sun Zong Yao Ting. Uh, Thank 然后给我这个机会 第三块呢，我想介绍一下我们所在的行业，我们在江南和Jane so first of all, thank to Mr. Lee and the Governor McMaster's opening and welcome for us. And thank to Ms. Lighty, Mr. Hu, and Ms. Long's splendid speeches for us. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And Ms. Sun just said she's sorry that she couldn't really speak English, so I'll be the translator here for the entire speech. And she's truly honored to have the opportunity to invite all of you to travel all the way to South Carolina and to this event and have the opportunity to make this introduction for everybody. There will be four parts in her speech. The first one will be a quick overview of JN Fiber family, which is Sun Fiber and the Sun Recycling, um, as what we do. The second part will be Ms. Sun's reasons to invest in South Carolina, as well as what we learned from our success so far. Number three will be her personal notes on our continuous investment in sustainable industry for over 20 years between China and the U.S. at JN and the parent company Cixi Jiangnan. And lastly, she'll touch base on our next move in the corporations and investment in the South Carolina. All right, to save us some time, uh, I'll do the introduction of the company first. So um, first of all, that's, let's talk about Sun Fiber. Sun Fiber is wholly owned by GM Fiber Inc. It's an entity we established to manage all the investments in the US. It is a recycled polyester staple fiber manufacturer. And we started a production back in December, 2015. The investment amount we've made into this entity is $39 million so far. And we currently have 200 employees on site. 
the main application of our products is filling materials for home textile and the furniture, furniture industries. There are two production lines on site and which annual gives an annual capacity at 120 million pound staple fiber. And we use purely recycled PET flakes as our raw material at some fiber. Then some recycling. This is a newer facility we um, built at Pageland. It's about one hour drive away from here. Started production in July, 2019. The investment already made to this place is $6 million so far. And we currently have new investment made to it already. Have two, 20 employees and uh, recycled PET flakes is our final product. The end use market of this kind of product are um, fiber industries, polyester sheet, film, packaging straps, and uh, bottles. We currently only have one production line completed uh, with an annual capacity of th 35 million pounds. And the current in progress investment made to it will add another line and another 40 million pound capacity to it. So we use PET bottles, like the water bottles you're using on the table as our raw material as some recycling. And this is the uh, like geographic location of the two facilities, both in South Carolina. Okay, and then we come down to our parent company. It's located in Zhejiang province in China. It's called Zhejiang Nan Chemical Fiber Limited. It's totally family owned by Miss Sun's family. And it's been in business for 20 years, completely devoted in manufacturing recycled polyester stable fiber. We currently have 420 employees over there for fiber production lines with an annual capacity of 200 50 million pound and the four PET production lines. Na, Tisha Chu was shang, Jesa Isha woman, Sui Tozi Nanka, Iji, the Nanka and Gutangong, the Yuanying. Na, uh, she named Chen, Dang or Jeting, so Shanga, Dong Mego like Tozi the Soho, Nanka, just woman the social. 那么在此之前呢只是时间将来已经跟南卡有十年的超过十年的一个贸易往来那么我们经过了四就是两年的四次的对美对南卡的一个考察南卡政府对于当地的一个制造业的一个友好然后他发达的一个国内国际的交通网
那说实在话，在一个新的地方去投资，他要经历的磨难是非常多的，远远超出我当时的一个想象。但是不管怎么样呢，那些都是一个商业领域的问题，这些困难和挫折并不能减轻我对 Chester 对于 South Carolina 的一个热爱。那非常幸运，我们经过了全体员工的一个不懈的努力，呃，在这些困难的情况下。我们还是说，在第二年就实现了盈利，就是我们运营的第二年就实现了盈利。那今天我们在 Richburg 和 Pageland 有超过两百多名的员工，那其中百分之九十以上都是当地的工人。呃，总之吧，我南卡，我觉得南卡一个优越的一个优势所在的一个优势，以及我们母公司的在这个行业里面的技术的一个优势。那包括我们全体员工的努力配合，以及供应商和服务商的支持，那加上我们美国的一个大市场，这一些综合性的因素，成就了我们今天 s u n f i b e r 和 s u n r e c y c l i n g 在这里的一个成功。那在此，我想再一次的感谢南卡，感谢 Chester。然后感谢我们所有的供应商和客户，感谢我们商会的成员们，然后也感谢我们的全体员工。那第三块呢，我想要讲一下说成功的因素。我觉得我们除了选了一个好的地方，我们还选了一个好的行业。那二十三年前，就是我父亲预见到了说资源回收行业会是一个很有前景的一个行业，我们开始投资这个行业。那再生短纤维，我们从二十三年的国内的一条生产线，然后每年十五万磅的一个产能，然后扩张到今年，今天在中美两边，我们有六条的短纤维生产线，有超过三百八十万磅的一个纤维的产能，扩张了二十五倍。Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> It's gonna be a long one. I'll try to cover everything she just mentioned. All right, I'll do my best. So the reasons why we choose South Carolina to invest and why we have made success in South Carolina are: so 11 years ago, when when we decided to make investment in U.S., South Carolina was our first choice. The parent company had been doing business with major customers in South Carolina over 10 years back then already. So, and then when we come over, the warm welcome from the South Carolina government, as well as the non-governmental populations, the excellent international and uh, domestic transportation advantage uh, Ms. Robert has introduced as well. And then the great geographical environment, a very nice climate here with distinctive four seasons and a low cost uh, land and energy and also most importantly the friend people all of those above um, after the four round of researches in the in two years period Mason's family made the decision to put their, all their investment in South Carolina without any hesitations so for here she said she want to give a special thank to the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce and also Chester um, economic development. They have served us very well back then when we were doing the site selection. She initially reached out to John Ling, Mr. John Ling, who's sitting on the table here today to talk about um, coming to South Carolina. And she received a very good welcomes from the governor and uh, secretary of commerce back then. And uh, the picture she showed there, the, uh, the manager Andy has come up with a very good proposal with, Andrew, with very good proposal of everything we asked for and uh, worked with John Lee the whole time. Mason said she still has a vivid memory when we decided we choose um, Chester as our uh, facility. The, County supervisor back then, he just came out of the hospital and wanted to host a dinner for us. And he held Miss Sun's hand and said, um, Chester really needs manufacturing and let's do it. So um, she, she felt this is something she needs when, when she started a new business. And she also mentioned, everybody knows when you start a new business in a new place, it's always going to be difficulties after difficulties and many, many challenges. But this is, just business decision. She said none of that had any put any hesitation in her head about South Carolina. 
right? And although we have experienced a lot of um, obstacles, but luckily with all of our employees and the support of self, selfless support from our parent company, Sun Fiber has actually um, turned into profitable within two years after the investment. So today we have over 220 employees in both, both Richburg and the Page Learn facilities and over 90%, which is about 200 of them are local workforces. So to, to just wrap it up, the, the characteristic advantage from South Carolina, our technical advantage for, from our parent company in the industry and the teamwork of our entire employee base and also the support from our suppliers and the vendors, as well as this huge market opportunity in, in the US has made us today. So Ms. said that she wants to thank the South Carolina, thank Chester, Chesterfield, all our suppliers, customers, and uh, the Jiangnan supporting team, as well as Sun Fibers employees again. 不好意思,剛剛講的比較高興,然後就忘了給翻譯時間,也回到第二部分,我剛剛時間講了一部分,Catherine就就到我第一段是好。So, she said she got a little bit carried away, but I'll, I'll catch up, we are fine. <laughs> um, and she also mentioned, of course, another key reason of our success is we selected the absolutely right industry over 23 years ago her father has foresaw the potential business opportunity of resource recycling and decided to end the family original business in apparel manufacturing and moved on to the recycled polyester stable fiber industry yeah now so his very wise decision has led to the achievements of the both parent company and also our US entities today. And the so the Sun Fiber, the JM Fiber family grow from only one production line with a 15 million pound annual throughput to six lines today in total with a 380 million pound capacity. It has expanded 25 times over the 23 years. Uh, we also have five PET bottle facilities um, with 200 million pound capacity of recycled PET production as well. So we have focused in this industry and this industry only over the last 23 years and continue to invest the majority of our profits out of it back into it simply because we love it. Yeah. Uh, 然后我们看说联合国它对于这个议题之间有十七个大的目标，从零七二零贫困到我们这个叫生物保护以及气候行动。但是即便是在制造行业，实际上我们从清洁生产一直到我们说投资新能源等等，也是一个非常大的选择。
different and difficult industry. It requires the most efforts, whilst of course bring the most sense of achievement to the practitioners. 那我之所以说最紧迫，是因为有好多的数据是将大家在整个一个环境污染这个模块，大家已经看到非常多的宣传。但是在这里，我还是说想给大家列一些数据。首先，一个全球每天都有一百万个 PET 瓶被使用，然后呢，他们绝大多数都是一次性的。然后第二个，我们塑料行、塑料这个产业从上世纪五十年代开始到今天。它一直在不断的一个扩张当中，而且我们原来的塑料制品，它可能就是一个耐用品，但是现在越来越多的像一次性消费品来过渡。那第三个关键是，这些都还是非可就不可再生的能源。那么第四个呢，我们看到就是说，从我们看一个总量，从五十年代的非常低的一个数字，到现在千万吨一年，每一年的消费量是千万吨。那这么多的一个用量，绝大多数，我们下面我下面做的这个表说，绝大多数都是被当做一个垃圾填埋，然后呢，只有百分之九被回收利用，百分之十二被焚烧，那剩下的就是进入到自然的环境中。所以说，我们整个一个的环境，无论是内陆还是海洋，到处都已经被塑料所覆盖。那这些塑料很多，它不能立刻降解，它都变成一个微颗粒。然后通过一个自然的循环，到进入到我们每一个人，呃，所以我我就不再多说，好多好多的数据大家都能够看到。那么我们第二个就是说 ，sorry， <笑><笑> so the reason why we feel this is the most urgent um industry is the scrap the plastic. Waste has become a global problem, and our planet is being flooded with the plastic pollutions. Um, as the the PowerPoint Miss made on there, and as well as the graphs she showed, it tells you the numbers from the early 1950s, um, how the plastic industry has grown so much, and uh, how much of the plastics has actually ended up in the landfill. So. It is estimated that one million plastic beverage bottles are sold every minute worldwide, and many of them, and also as well as the disposable containers, are currently made of plastic and are designed to be only used once. So most for most of us, this has become a lifestyle of ours. The plastic production has grown, like she showed on the graph, on on the graphs, and other than any other materials. While the world has shifted, also the production from durable plastics to more and more single-use ones. You can tell over 99% of the plastics are made from chemical derived from oil, gas, and coals. So they are all non-clean, non-renewable resources um, for this planet. The researchers estimated that since the early 1950s, humans have produced 8.3 billion metric tons of plastics, and uh, as we are seeing on the numbers, 12 of them are incinerated, 9% are recycled only, and the rest of them all ended up in the landfills or the oceans. And the rivers will carry those plastics waste from inland to the ocean, and that make them a major contribution to the ocean pollution these days. Um, plastic waste, whether in rivers, oceans, or land, can be very persist in the environment um, for centuries. Most of plastic items actually will never completely disappear; they just become smaller and smaller. Most of those tiny, tiny. Particles and then will be ingested by the animals or fishes, as they mistakenly thought that's a food for them, and then it will end up on our dinner table as well, which just gives us a very bad cycle for the plastics. 我们说回到最直接，就是说，我们每个人都在使用它。我们几乎每个人，它在我们生生活的每一个边上。每一个人习惯的一个小的改变，它都可以为减少这个塑料垃圾做出贡献。我们知道说我们在生活中的环节，我们的生活环境已经离不开它，那么至少我们回收它。
Exactly. And the immediacy actually shows in because almost everyone uses plastics and a, a very small change in everyone's lifestyle will actually contribute to reduce the waste. So since our living environment at the moment, there's no way of making big changes um, to avoid a single use plastics. So let's recycle it to help. Okay. Um, we let's come back to the PET recycles. So the re where are we? Right. So the, the reuse industry when where JN is, the largest portion of all plastics is PET. And we have to know where it comes from before we know how to deal with it. Because so the polyesters, we short for PET, has very good mechanical properties, um, electrical insulations, and chemical resistance. So, um, so it is very widely used in all types of the fields. Listen, just showed a few pictures as in textile, in packaging, in medicals and engineering as well. Um, among in all of those plastics is most widely used and also mostly used in large amount. At present, its product has already developed into many, many series, hundreds of different types and thousands of different specifications. So for those PETs, not just the, the, the color and the forms of it in the in different application areas, the performance and the characters of the PETs are all different. They vary very, very greatly. So which significantly increases our difficulties to recycle, to sort and to reuse them. Okay, so we're going to narrow it back even down to just the, the bottle flakes. Uh, so the PET pinpin,我们来说它加工困难的一个程度。他们觉得大多数都首先被丢弃在垃圾当中。然后呢,大多数就直接被埋掉了。然后会有一些垃圾回收商,他们在埋之前做一个筛选,然后呢,就形成了 我们中间的这个图片叫做路边瓶，就是从垃圾中自动捡出来的，它是一个出水。然后这些这个原料回收的原料，它里面的真正的PET的含量可能百分之六十都不到，然后有很多垃圾，这是一类。你可以上来一点
First of all, most of those bottles are discarded in garbage and the majority of them will go straight to landfills. Luckily, some of the trash collectors will actually sort the garbage before it goes to the landfill. So they will pick out some of the PED bottles for us and we call them, that's what shows in the middle picture here, and we call them curbside bottles in our industry. Those bottles are mixed with various uh, com contaminations and the content of actual recyclable PET are usually less than 60%. And the second type is the first picture, we called it post-consumer bottles. So these are usually collected from recycle programs, but all other programs in the in US are at the moment are, are a mixed recycle. So to try to identify PD bottles out of it increases the difficulty. And usually you get about 70% of recyclable PET content out of those um, bales. And the best type, which is the last picture, we called it deposit bottles. So about 11 states in US right now has deposit bottle bills. They'll reward you five to 10 cents when you resell a bottle. And except for the, the caps, the labels, and some leftover beverages in those bottles, the majority of those are actually PET. So we will be able to get over 80% of the recyclable material out of those. Now, just the different types of recycled materials, we have to make them as a team of very clean materials, and then make them into a product we hope to make a product for the environment. For our company, 呃，这个技术上不是问题，我们都能够解决。但是作为一家企业，我们必须要考虑经济效益。那上面的三种类型的这个来源，它无论是在技术上，还是说就是设备的配置上面，还是说在生产过程中的一个生产和管理的难度上面，还是说。它的一个成本上，还是说它在再次被处理的过程中，对环境的第二次污染上面，包括最后经济效益都是不一样的。Okay, so if we look at the process stage for from Sun Fibers or Sun Recycling's perspective, it's technically feasible to process any types of aforementioned bottles into raw material for industrial production and use them to process the best fiber, but um, they are so they are so much much differences between each other. But from a business's perspective, we have to consider our profit to to make it keep going, and to achieve efficient process. Whether it is in the investment cost, the production management cost, or just production unit cost, and also the the second round impact on the environment when we are cleaning those. Um, flakes and uh, also our final economic gain are greatly different for all of those um, different types. So the sheet, I'm not going to read each one of them. It just shows you um, the differences into um, processing the different types of the bottle sources. Yeah, of course, the 我觉得我们至少减少垃圾，减少把它当做垃圾，然后让我们回收它。那 ，OK， of course the best type we would love are all the deposit bottles, but we all know it's not going to be possible. So that is why we are trying to make a difference here to see if we can improve the whole recycling rate here and be able to get our hands on more recyclable um, PETs. 呃、uh, ，我们回到说，我们觉得我们自己，我们这个行业很辛苦。之所以很辛苦，是因为回收和加工的一个困难程度，决定了这个行业的辛苦程度。然后它又是一个垃圾处，等于说是一个资源回收的行业。我们不高大上，我们的生产线，我们等一下大家看到没有那么多多的漂亮，因为我们做的工作性质决定了这一个。但是呢。我们说，我们的这个辛苦不单单是因为环境，不单单是因为我们做了这个，我们的辛苦还在于，因为它不同的应用领域，它的复杂性，导致我们在回收用它的时候，我们需要很多的灵活性，我们需要很多的技术性。
Okay. And uh, the efforts we're talking about to recycle those um, PETs. The difficulties in recycling the process um, determine how hard this industry is. And Ms. said the majority of the guests today here will go to our facility to tour the plant in the afternoon. You will see the facility is not one of those, um, like the most beautiful places because what we do, you know, we're trying to recycle um, the materials that some other people consider as trash. Um, but we, we, we consider it's very meaningful. And uh, because of its flexibility and uh, like the technologies in the application field, um, there are so many different forms of it. So, and also for some fiber, we not only recycle the PET bottles, we also recycle a lot of other different forms of the PETs, and it really increases the difficulty and uh, requires an extra effort for us to work on it. X光片等等 So the different forms I just mentioned so Sun Fiber not just not only just recycle the PET bottles we also recycle um, and use all the other forms such as um, the packaging straps the waste film and the sheet you can see on the pictures, x-ray films. And at our parent company, we can even recycle the PET apparels to use them, make into brown fibers in that corner. Uh, 如果没有这个行业回收环节、处理环节，还是应用领域这环节，后期的加工都有大量的工作可以做，大量的课题可以研究。when we talk about achievements, Ms. said, uh, first of all, this is a very noble industry because tens of millions tons of scrapped polyesters will endanger, endanger our planet as scavengers every year without our industry. So this industry is definitely worth our effort. And secondly, it is an extremely challenging industry with the diversity and the complexity of the raw materials we have to deal with. How to turn the waste into treasure and how to make it have both economic and a social value in the recycling process, whether it's in the early recycling stage or the later process um, steps. There are a lot of work still can be done and uh, so many topics can worth researching into. Uhfiber来讲,还有是一个赚钱的行业,这个很重要哦,我们说我们是一个商业行为。以及应用领域我们已经做到了一个极致
And most importantly, for some, this is also a money-making industry. So for more than 20 years, our team has devoted to study every single step of this process, identify the, the potentials and have achieved. Mr. said we can proudly say that we have achieved the ultimate, ultimate in the processing and application fields and realize the optimal processing of various materials. And we also have realized the categorized usage of the recycled PET according to um, its differences in performances and the cat, um, characteristics. And dozens of the varieties have been developed in production of the re recycled polyester fiber, and we have definitely maximized the value of the entire process. Uh, Gong 但是我们六月份就要启动跟他们有一个合作那今天我想在这里宣布一下我们今年我们一定我们将正式启动这个扩建的一个项目我们预计的一个固定资产投资大概在三千五百万美金左右那么假设这个项目建成我们会增加一百个以上的工作岗位然后呢我们将新建两千
创造美好的未来。谢谢大家。So what's on the screen is Ms. Sun's ultimate vision. She would like to realize the common health, safety, and the growth of the company, employees, and all the partners we work together through our business successes. And we hope with our success, we'll be able to serve back the community we are in and create a better future together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Zhou. Also, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Ms. Sun. Thanks, Catherine, uh, for the eloquent remarks and the brilliant translation. I think that's a great example for perfect teamwork. Thanks again. Okay, so now it's time to move to the discussion part of today's program. Um, as Ms. Fen just mentioned that um, sustainability is such a massive subject. So we are going to focus on recycling in the rest of the discussion today. It's a real privilege to have three experts from the industry with different backgrounds join us today. Um, I'd like to first invite up Mr. Alastair Carmichael, Program Director of the National Association for PET Container Resources. Mr. Carmichael, please. Thank you, um, and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks so much to the uh, Chamber of Chinese Chamber of Commerce for um, producing this wonderful event, and particular thanks to Sun Fibers. Uh, I met Ms. Sun eight years ago, um, and what you have done in eight years is remarkable, and what you are going to do, as you've just presented, is even more remarkable. Congratulations. <laughs> So, okay, I'll go straight. So I'm Alastair Carmichael. I'm a program director with NAPCOR. NAPCOR is the trade association for the PET container industry in North America. Uh, we're a relatively small trade association, but we're very focused. All we are interested in is PET. Um, so the bottle side of PET uh, in the, as a container is obviously a key part of our involvement. We have the, the resin producers, you'll see from the right-hand side of the slide, we have the PET resin producers, the virgin producers. We have people who make sheet which goes into thermoforms. Thermoforms are what you see in the grocery store with your blueberries, strawberries, etc with your bakery items, with your salad items. That's all PET, the container that um, holds those. And then we have the PET reclaimers uh, as part, of, a major part of our membership. Basically, 92% of the reclaimers in the US, PET reclaimers in the US are our members. Um, and we also have a lot of the, the container producers, the people who actually make the bottles. Um, but all of us are focused on PET. Um, one thing that in an audience that's you know, not just devoted to the industry, I think it's worth just pointing out where PET fits in this industry and that it is actually the same uh, chemical um, content as polyester. I think we're all familiar with polyester fibers. I'm a fibers person going back for many years, and I still can't go into a, a retail store or, or anywhere that's selling product without turning the label. What's it made of? Uh, and as you turn the label, polyester is really prevalent. It is incredible how much polyester has grown over the years and into things that I, I started in the industry when polyester first began in the late 1960s. Um, and the, the development that we've seen in polyester applications in fibers and apparel is just fantastic since then. It's a wonderful fiber. But the, the chemical compound, the chemical makeup for polyester fibers is just the same as what goes in to make this bottle. So it's a wonderfully uh, versatile fiber uh, and we need the same raw materials to, uh, to service that business. This just gives you a global look 
at how big the business is. Um, we have approximately 190 billion pounds of polyester and PET produced annually. Um, and this is the 2019 split pre-COVID in, in a relatively normal year. 64% of that goes into fibers and 27% goes into the pet resin, which is the packaging end of the business. And then there are fairly small applications in film and other areas. The one thing that really jumps out when you look at capacities, which is one of the boxes on the right, um, China has a capacity for PET and polyester of 163 billion pounds. The second largest country is India with only 27 billion pounds and the US has 13 billion pounds. So the scale of China is just unbelievable. Um, the, the way they've grown and, and adapted to, to the polyester business. But as Ms. Sam pointed out, the big problem that we are faced with is plastic pollution. And every time you see an article on plastic pollution, the poor old water bottle on a beautiful beach is the poster child of what goes wrong. In actual fact, PET is the easiest plastic to recycle and has the highest recycling rates of all plastics. But to get the, the reader's attention, um, the, the view of the water bottle is iconic in terms of its negative um, point of view that, that's put out there. So why is it always? Well, well, how does the PET bottle get there? Well, somebody didn't do the right thing in the first place. Somebody did not put that bottle in the right container to be recycled. Now, there are reasons for that. Maybe the recycling facilities and, and infrastructure is not very good in that country or in that state. Um, and so the easiest thing for the consumer to do is throw it out of the car window or, or, or just not dispose of it correctly. Um, so that's one of the things we have to address. We have to address making it easy for the consumer to put it in the right place and for the infrastructure to be developed to, um, to, to, handle, to handle that. Um, and I, I won't go through all, those, all the data. Just look at the last bullet. In 2020, the global PET recycling rate was 53%. Now, all you ever hear about in plastics recycling is, oh, they only recycle 8%, 10%, 9%. And that may well be true because there are an awful lot of plastics out there which are not as easily recycled as PET. And that's a very important fact to, 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 to keep in mind that not all plastics are made equal in terms of their recyclability. And PET has a 53% global recycling rate. Regrettably, we don't have that in the US. Regrettably, the US has a dreadful record of recycling its PET. Um, and this little chart, again, this was pre-COVID, shows that the US recycled 28% only of its PET bottles. And I'd like to look at the, 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 the sort of title of the chart. We're better than Bulgaria, but we're not quite as good as Greece. Uh, and there are a lot of countries that are a whole lot better. And as you see right to the far left, Germany claims 97% of their PET bottles are recycled. I find that difficult to believe, but that's what the Germans claim. Um, J Japan does over 90%. And Japan does not have a deposit system, which is the best incentive to make people recycle bottles. If they know this bottle is worth 10 cents or five cents, if they take it back to the redemption center, a pretty good number of people will do that. Um, and most of these countries with high recycle rates have deposit systems. Uh, and as Ms. Sun and Catherine said, there are actually 10 states in the US where there are deposit systems and they have much higher recycle rates than the states that don't have recycle uh, deposit systems. So 
one of the areas that I would leave with you, and particularly to our government people, let's do better at recycling. And deposit systems are the best way to get those bottles back. So in 2020, um, there was the total amount of RPET, recycled PET, that was collected in the U that was used in the US was 1.8 billion pounds. So it is not a small amount, but it is still only 28% 20, of what it should be if we were recycling 100%. Um, NAPCOR does a report on this every year. We've done it for 26 years. This is the 2020 report was the 26th year that we have looked at the uh, recyclability, the recycling rate for uh, PET. The interesting thing on this chart is that the blue line is what goes into fibers. So what you will see this afternoon at Sun Fibers is in that blue line. The green line is what goes back into bottles. Now, if you look at that green line back in 2010, it was a relatively low number. But in 2020, for the first time in 26 years, more RPET was going into bottles than into fibers. And that is a trend that is going to continue because of all the legislation that is now being passed where uh, in California, for example, even as of this year, every manufacturer has to have at least 15% RPET in their bottles. In 2025, it will be 25%. In 2030, it will be 50%. Now, if you're only collecting 30% of your bottles, how do you get 50% back in RPET? You can't do it. We have to improve the collection. So this is a very, a very important uh, issue that is going around in the industry right now. Uh, bottles, bottles are at all time highs in terms of price. A bale of bottle PET bottles in on the East Coast now sells for close to 50 cents a pound. It's never been that high. Why? Supply and demand. Good old supply and demand. And a lot of that demand is coming from the bottle companies who want to put their bottles, the RPET, back into bottles. Um, so, PET is the most recyclable uh, plastic out there. Um, so we love all this move to, to make, increase the uses for, P, for RPET. The trouble is collection. And that's the issue that we have to address. We have to improve collection, capture through the system, and we're going to need legislation to get where we need to be to meet the, the, the legislated commitments of how much RPEC goes into a product and the brand commitments of how much they are going to put in. Coca-Cola has committed to 50% RPEC content in all its bottles. Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, all these others have made commitments as well. So it's not something that is, yeah, it's a nice idea. There's a lot of weight behind it going forward. And the, I have to say the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which most of you will be familiar with, has been a huge driving force. In, um, in pushing this through. So um, looking at it back into fibers, RPET back into fibers, there's an association called Textile Exchange, which is very much at the apparel end of the textile chain and the brands and the retailers, the Walmarts, the H&Ms, the Gaps, uh, Polo, all these companies are brands that are within Textile Exchange as an association. They say that currently, 14% of all the polyester that is used in apparel is our pet. 14%, that's pretty high, but you've got to consider most of that's coming from China. Most of it's coming from Asia anyway. Uh, most of the apparel comes from Asia. And there is not a big application in Asia for our pet back into containers. That's growing. Um, but Textile Exchange, just last year, got their members to commit to an our pet challenge. And their challenge is that we're not going to put 14% RPET into apparel. We're going to challenge you to put 45% of your polyester will be RPET. That is 17 million tons of RPET. There's no way they're going to get that from bottles. Um, so it's very interesting that Ms. Sun in her presentation mentioned that um, 
the company in China is doing apparel recycling. And that is the future that has to be taken care of. And that will go back to the apparel companies designing their products for recycling. That does not happen today. I mean, the more different fiber polymers you can put into a fabric, the more trim, the more, um, the more difficult you can make it to recycle is actually the main direction. They've got to change direction completely and move to designing products for recycling. And the potential will, will increase. And, and that's the only way that they can meet these sort of challenges that are coming through from, um, from, from textile exchange and, and other people. So our pet is very positive for the environment, but we just need to collect and recycle more PET bottles so we will have available supplies. And on that note, I will say thank you for your attention. And I think we're going to a panel, are we, for discussion? Anyway, if there are any questions, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Yes, sir. And there's, there's no incineration, as far as I know, in South Carolina, there's no incineration of PET, as far as I know. Um, and look, we're trying to move away from that. Uh, it's, not, it's not the way forward. The way forward to handle the very dirty PET is what we call chemical recycling. And Eastman have just made an announcement just in the last two or three weeks that they're in over a billion dollars in a PET recycle, chemical recycling plant in France, and they're currently building one in Tennessee, Bristol, Tennessee. And we believe that that is going to be the, the application that will be able to take the dirty PET. And one of the big markets for PET in fibers is carpet. And it is really difficult to pull up a carpet and just recycle the fibers. Um, the Eastman plant will be a major market for carpet fiber. So there are much better opportunities coming than just burning it for power uh, because the pollution that you get from, from burning it almost, almost negates the benefits of reusing it. Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh -huh. And then after burning the carpet, it's whatever that is, the final ash they put in the carpet. Yeah. Could be used in the water. Yeah. That's so fantastic. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm trying to run it. Yeah. I'm going to show my position. Yes, yes, congratulations. I've, I've probably been to you. I've probably been to your plant at one time or other. I spent a lot of time in China visiting various polyester plants. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mark. Carmichael for your very informative and inspiring presentation. So now I'd like to invite up Ms. Mary McQueen, Executive Director of the Caroline Recycling Association to give us a brief presentation. We're in trouble now. That's not my strong suit. Good afternoon, or is it still morning, everyone? It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate being invited so very much. Thank you to the Chinese General Chamber of Commerce. It's great to get to know you and uh, 
especially thank you to Sun Fiber, our friend and uh, sponsor and partner, who is a company that does good just by doing its business. And, uh, and that's truly, I think, what makes recycling unique. Um, and I'm especially looking forward to my good night's sleep that I'll be getting on my new pillow. <laughs> oh, let's see, here we go. So the Carolina Recycling Association, I've been the executive director for a little over five years. And we are a nonprofit association, a professional association. And our mission is to advance waste reduction and recycling in the Carolinas. Our vision is that we will be a driving force for the success of the recycling industry in the two states. And that's really important to us to support the industry that um, supports recycling in our two states. So we do um, want to be part of that driving force. We're a 501 C3. We established in 1989, so it's been around for 33 years. Um, I haven't been working there <laughs> that long or been around uh, since the inception. I was nine uh, when it began. And so you can see that um, it's taken many, many years to, and, and a lot of people's hard work to get where we are at today. Uh, we have 300 organizational members of our association, and that, make, that um, comes to about over 800 individual professionals that are part of the association in the two states. And we have over 30 sponsors that help support the association in addition to the members. Here's our membership by sector. So as you can see, the business sector is a huge part of our membership, but we do represent local government, nonprofits and universities. And so it really is a mixture and we represent the interests of all of them. But we could not continue without our business partners. So what do we do? <clears throat> we educate. What would recycling in the Carolinas be like if there were not education for our professionals in the industry? Um, we host the largest conference in the Southeast with over 500 attendees every year. We provide four lunch and learns. We provide quarterly webinars and we provide legislative days and trainings for our members. We connect the industry. So we are filling a need uh, of providing that medium for our businesses to network and to do business. Uh, we bring them together through our Recycling Business Connections event annually, networking events, and our Ciara Connect online community, which is a private uh, online community that provides a forum for our members to discuss recycling, to post jobs, to do all sorts of things. We inspire, we create social media tools for our local governments and other recycling programs to use and free to anyone, not just our members, because we understand that the mission is not just to help our own members, but to help the entire industry, members or not. We provide sponsorships to other organizations and we provide scholarships to our conference and to our events. We inform, we have a monthly newsletter. We do actually a podcast and uh, we do legislative alerts uh, key legislative alerts for the membership, and we advocate. This is something that we have been focusing on more and more as an association by providing legislative days and um, getting involved at the national level with the National Recycling Coalition, which I'm on the board of, I can see you guys better this way, which I'm on the board of uh, directors for, and uh, that deals with uh, national recycling issues. And so how do we do this? Can you guess how many staff members we have that do all this? Who thinks five, four, three, two and a half? <laughs> we have two and a half staff members, uh, the half being uh, not a half of a person, but a part-time person. 
so we really rely on um, these pillars of having a strong recycling organization. And this is the case for any recycling association anywhere in the country. Did you know that there are actually 23 state recycling organizations across the country? Uh, not 50, there's not one in every state. So, you know, these are common pillars that, that bring success to all, of, to all of us. But in particular, CRA is actually the second largest association, uh, recycling association in the country after California. We're certainly not the second largest state in the mix. So I think that these pillars really, uh, the most important one is that we have really strong state level agencies like the Department of Commerce Recycling um, Division. In North Carolina, we have the North Carolina Division of Environmental Assistance and Customer Service. And we have the Division of, Envir of Health and Environmental Control also in South Carolina that, uh, that works on that arm. And so it's very important to have these strong agencies that the legislature and the, our lawmakers support financially year to year because they can fill very important roles. And then associations like CRA can come in and we can do things that they can't do. And so it's very important to collaborate and we work very well together to make sure we never work at cross purposes. We always want to be on the same page with what we're doing. We have, so, you know, that's speaking to partnerships and collaboration. So there's never uh, a policy that we're going to, uh, as an association support or uh, put out there that we would like to see passed if without working with our friends and stakeholders at these agencies. We have to have strong markets and industry support, as I showed you, the over 50% of our association being from the business community. We are very fortunate to have great markets in the Southeast compared to the rest of the country. While other areas struggle, we continue to thrive. And that is in, in great part thanks to the industry, for companies like Sun Fiber, and for again, po policy support, such as incentives and other um, help that comes from that level. We have passionate professionals. We have so many volunteers. We, <laughs> we have actually seven different committees and at least seven, seven subcommittees, all volunteer that work to make this a success. We have a 15 member working board that, uh, that does the work of the organization. And we have an unbelievable amount of meetings, uh, committee meetings, probably, I don't know, 20 hours a month at least of committee meetings. Uh, so we might beat some of you guys on how many committees we have, I don't know. Um, we have great participation, people who care uh, that want to feed the industry. You know, recycling is a really, unique uh, place where business and sustainability meet. And I know we've talked a lot about that already today and learned so much from our colleagues uh, that it does a good just by nature of doing business. And I can't think of very many examples of where that happens, where a business does a good at, in that way. Um, but recycling is challenging as some have mentioned because our customers are everyone and we are selling a behavior and that behavior is not always taught from a young age. It was for me, thankfully, but we are trying to sell a behavior and not only are we trying to ask people to buy recycled products, recycled content packaging, but also trying to get them to give us their material when they no longer want it. So they're not buying anything. They're not wanting anything. They have something that they no longer want. And how do we get into that group? How do we get into their mind? And so it is, it's, imagine if your business depended on that. I know many of you uh, are not in the recycling business. Uh, it's, it's quite unique. So as was mentioned by Alistair, 
he's he has alluded to the idea of the circular economy and so that is what we want that is ultimately what we're working towards an intentional system uh, that is begins at the design um, phase and where design um, is for recyclability is for the end of life a cradle to cradle philosophy we do believe that we can do better and we've talked about this we need to do better to conserve these to stop this to fight this, to protect this. And I just wanted an excuse to show my kids because they're so cute, aren't they? <laughs> we need to protect this for future generations, for them and their grandchildren, and they better have grandchildren. For, they better give me some grandchildren. So, I would be remiss if I didn't give you a call to action today because um, I like to just break it down to the level. Uh, you know, you may be thinking to yourself kind of, Mary, what can I do? You're probably also thinking what's for lunch, but um, you know, what can you do? You know, this is a beautiful campaign that we created uh, that uh, our communications uh, team created called Be One Less. And being one less bottle, one less straw, one less plastic bag, when everyone does it, the collective impact obviously is much greater. And that's what we need to do to reduce waste and we can't forget that. But as it relates to recycling, I'm gonna ask you to be one more. One more recycler at home and at work you know, you don't have to be a recycling business to have, to give recycling uh, access to your employees, to yourself at work. It's really important to participate so that we feed Sun Fiber. Uh, we feed other companies that are using these materials. Be one more advocate, whether it's in your local government or whether it is uh, at your dinner party. You know, talk about it and advocate for it. Advocate at a greater level, advocate at your state level, at your local level for your city council. I can't tell you how many, there's been many programs that have been under threat uh, in the Carolinas of elimination recently due to market conditions. And this council saying this is too expensive and we don't wanna pay it. So, so many of those have been saved just by citizens going in and saying, no, we do want to pay a little bit more for this. And board, city board decisions have been completely reversed the next month because of citizens. And so you do have that power at the local level and above. As a company sponsor, your state association in the state where you live, support their efforts, become a member of your associations or of your national organizations and provide support, volunteer, um, your time, serve on committees, help. And that is what we all need to do to be one more. I would like to see the company on this list. Uh, this is a great, um, this is a great example of corporate support of, of what business can do to support recycling. And you can see Sun right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, um, for your amazing work. You know, two and a half people is not a big group, but you guys are making huge impact. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to invite up our last speaker of this discussion, Ms. Anna Village, the Recycling Market Development Manager at the South Carolina Department of Commerce. Let's welcome. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Chester, South Carolina. 
I certainly want to thank Ms. Sun uh, for hosting this event and certainly our distinguished guests and the folks who have traveled from the, the um, Chinese Chamber of Com Greater Chamber of Commerce, thank you for being here. Uh, you are just in for a treat, especially this afternoon. Has anyone been to the, tour the facility at Sun Fiber yet? All right, a few of you. Well, I'm really a few more. <laughs> I'm really excited uh, that you'll get the opportunity uh, to experience that. Um, for the last 30 years, we have had staff at the South Carolina Department of Commerce that has focused on recycling market development. And this is really unique across the country because we're looking at recycling from an economic development lens, from the connection of job creation and really building investment across the state. Um, what I'd like to do today is give you just a sneak peek behind the curtain to share a little bit about uh, some of the successes that have really come out of that investment and that, uh, that connection. So certainly, we all hear about the environmental benefits of recycling, but the economic benefits are, are extremely strong and important in our state. Uh, so we're able to really connect uh, new markets and, and be, being able to really take that valuable, valuable material uh, to stimulate economic development, to create jobs and increase tax revenues across the state. Uh, so we used to be known as the tea state in South Carolina. What I mean by that is we're known for textiles and tobacco. Well, today, if you look at our largest industry sectors, uh, you'll see aerospace, automotive, and advanced manufacturing. So we've shifted uh, into the A state. Uh, but what's really interesting about all three of those industries is all three of them focus on recycling as a connection for what they do and how they do business. And this is extremely important, uh, whether it's companies like BMW that have commitments to more recycled content material. In fact, they've just committed to a vehicle made from 100% recycled materials that is 100% recyclable. Um, and, and that goes up and down across our state, companies like Volvo and, and Boeing that have made similar commitments. Uh, so whether, it, whether we're seeing that at um, the original equipment manufacturer level or whether we're seeing that from our homegrown businesses, it really makes a big impact all across the state. Um, we think of manufacturing, we think of lean, that has everything to do with uh, reducing waste across the board. So I'd like to talk to you about our competitive advantage, uh, some of our industry trends, as well as um, some opportunities that we have to create healthy places and healthy spaces in South Carolina. So you may not know this, but the South Carolina Department of Commerce established um, a state office in Shanghai in 2005. And in 2007, we signed a memora memorandum of uh, understanding with the Chinese government to establish and designate South Carolina as a preferred US location uh, for Chinese businesses to operate. And you can certainly see that growth. Um, certainly, we've heard uh, from Robert uh, about some of that investment earlier today. Uh, and really, we have a rich history of foreign direct investment across the state. Uh, so, so companies like Volvo and Sun Fiber and Hire and Cure and uh, Tektronic Industries are continuing to establish headquarters, uh, manufacturing facilities and distribution centers. We're, we're, we're continuing to see that growth, that growth as we heard from our secretary. And so th these investments are not by mistake. They are truly by design and they help make the connection for generating direct and indirect jobs, uh, tax revenue, international trade, leadership, and corporate citizenship, while also encouraging cultural exchange. And that truly is true for Sun Fibers. So attracting uh, foreign direct investment is really critical to what we do every single day. Our Secretary of Commerce mentioned that we have 300 recyclers across the state. Oh my goodness, there we go. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, we, we actually have a $13 billion economic impact across the state. Uh, we're really excited that we're updating that economic impact study this year. 
but that includes recycling from A to Z, a little bit of everything. Uh, so our team really works to expand the demand for recycled materials and recycled content products. So recycling means big business in South Carolina. So companies like Sun Fiber and Greenfield Industries and Pratt Recycling Materials, Pratt Advanced Materials are just a few examples of Chinese investment um, specifically for recycling processing. And the Palmetto State certainly is a leader for recycling industry related growth as well. In fact, we have more four times more recycling more um, jobs per capita uh, than California and uh, Massachusetts, two states that you really think about as strong in the recycling industry. Um, we have we have four four times more jobs per capita in the recycling industry uh, as compared to some of those states. But certainly the proof is in the data. Uh, we, we had a record year for investment across the board last year. And, and if we look at uh, recycling related investment, um, we recognize $522 million of investment across the state focused on recycling. Uh, and in fact, that was six companies representing 536 jobs. And if we look at that from, from the last five years, uh, we're looking at uh, $1.7 billion of investment um, and over 2,100 jobs. And in fact, you know, over the last decade, we've really benefited from the fact that we've had strong processing capacity across the state. Um, whereas a lot of states really struggle with this. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? Um, companies like Sun Fibers have made a, made a big impact to allow us to be able to not only have the jobs in recycling, but also being able to expand those jobs uh, from the processing side. So as Green Fence really launched in 2013, uh, and then four years later, we saw a project National Sword uh, many states really struggled to find outlets for material, but because South Carolina had such strong processing capacity, we were able to shift and navigate uh, and make some of those adjustments. So we have 15 industrial um, pr uh, plastics recyclers in the state. Uh, we have four uh, recycle content paper mills, a recycle content tissue mill, a glass processor. Uh, so the list really goes on. Um, similar to for, for uh, recycled content steel mills as well as an aluminum roller. So being able to process those materials here, uh, again, amplifies uh, that economic impact. And that's something that we are really proud of. And it, it brings me to some of the trends that we heard about earlier today as it relates to environmental, social, and governance goals. Certainly, we have uh, global companies in South Carolina that have made ambitious commitments to, uh, to sustainability goals, and we're really at that intersection of commerce and, and conservation to be able to identify opportunities to help support our businesses meet those needs. So we are well underway with, with a lot of those conversations. And that conversation, as we heard earlier, is really being driven by investors and consumers and employees. Uh, so it's no longer just a nice to have, it's a must have. And we're seeing that capital investment really uh, start, to, start to come into play at, at a really large level. In fact, uh, as many of you know, the Securities Exchange Commission on March 21st proposed a new rule to standardize climate-related disclosures for investors. Uh, so today, investors representing uh, literally tens of trillions of dollars uh, are supporting climate-related disclosures because they recognize that, this, that climate risks can pose a significant financial risk to companies. Um, and investors need reliable information in order to understand those risks. So we know that recycling helps those companies meet those goals. And I think that that's a, a story that we need to start sharing. And it's just really that simple. So it creates significant value for companies like Sun Fibers that are making these type of investments. Because when a furniture manufacturer, for example, purchases material from, from Sun Fibers, they're automatically reducing their carbon emissions from that material. 
And Sun Fibers has done a really great job on their website to showcase what those numbers look like and they can custom customize that for their customers as we start to really connect those numbers. And this opportunity, I feel like is really coming at us like a freight train and we're responding quickly. Um, and we certainly are ready to hit the ground running uh, and to help support our companies. And if we take a look at industry trends and opportunities, um, certainly Alistair talked a lot about our opportunities as it comes, as, as it relates to supply chain uh, for material. We have an opportunity for collection. Uh, to, to collect more material, and that opportunity is massive. Um, there are really three things that you need for a successful recycling program. We've talked about strong processing capacity, and we've talked quite a bit about that today. You need to have material that has a strong value in the marketplace. Alistair, Alistair did a great job of saying we, we do a good job of getting some of those uh, bottles into the bin, but we can do a better job. Uh, and we need those bottles because those bottles have a value in the marketplace, especially when we look at, um, so recycled polyester, as you know, tracks with the price of oil. So as oil prices are the way that they are today, the markets for polyester and recycled polyester fiber become that much more important. Um, but the third pillar of, this, of the leg that we really need to focus on is collection, getting more of those materials into the recycling bin uh, and making sure that we do that. And that's, a, that's an area that we do really struggle with. And so I'm really curious and excited to chat with NAPCOR about some opportunities that we can, we can consider as a state to move us forward. So we, we've also um, set up Your Bottle Means Jobs in the back of the room as a strategy for collection. So this is an area to connect directly with, with consumers as they're making that, as they're making that um, choice of whether they recycle or not. Uh, what we found is that if folks understand that their material is being recycled, oftentimes they're more likely to take that action. So what's interesting is that we, we have the opportunity in front of us. Um, and we don't have to be in Silicon Valley to create innovation. We have innovation here because we have, uh, we have expertise in the room. And so let's take advantage of the fact that we have expertise here in South Carolina, 300 businesses strong across the state with, with recycling. Um, there's a lot that we can do, and we're certainly excited to have you all here uh, and your brain power in this room to help us start to solve some of these global challenges. So thank you for your time, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Anna, for your insights. And since we are a little bit behind the schedule, so I might want to ask a huge favor for all our guests today. Save your question to the lunchtime because all our great speakers are going to stay with us for the rest of hours. So we will make sure you all got the opportunity to have your question answered. Okay, so now let's move to our second and the final discussion of the today. Um, we are going to focus on application market. So Catherine Fan, the Vice President of Business Development at Sun Fiber is going to lead the discussion for us. Catherine, please. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, all right. Okay. So now we can move on to the last session of, the, of today before we can move on to the nice um, lunch. <laughs> Um, we actually had the honor to be able to invite two of our largest customers from our customer base. Um, we have um, Charles Thompson from um, Arden Companies, which is the largest outdoor furniture producer in, in the America, and also the CEO of um, Stein Fibers, Robert Taylor. They are the largest distribu fiber distributor in the U.S. market as well. Um, this will ca carry it out in a slightly different setup. We are not going to do the 
podium speech. It will be a panel discussion between them and the Sun as well, because um, not everyone here knows our industry, what we do. So we decided we're not going to bore you with the dry speech. We will have a more live discussion about what um, how fiber industry is going these days. Okay, so let's welcome the guests. And before that, um, the president of Stan Fiber, Mr. Jaron Edwards couldn't make it, but he shoot a two minute video for us um, to say something about his company and also their relationship with, uh, with Stan Fiber. Okay. Um, Hello, I'm Jaron Edwards. I'm the president of Stein Fibers, and I sincerely regret that I cannot be there in person today. When I found out about this invitation from Mrs. Sun, I could tell how important this was, not just to her, but to all of Sun Fibers. And I truly regret I can't be there in person, but I got bit by the COVID bug. As you can see, I'm doing fine today, but out of precaution, this video was the much safer play. I've been with Stein Fiber since 1996. And in 2003, in one of my first trips into the country of China, I visited dozens of factories. And during that time, I visited CC Jingyan. And one of the things that stood out the most about this factory was not the equipment, it was the people, specifically Mrs. Sun and her family, and their focus on quality. Most of the factories in China were focused all on price, but Sixi Jinyan was always focused on quality and always in a pursuit to get better and better. And we're just excited to have uh, the opportunity for two decades to grow with them, not only in China, but now today with the expansion of sun fibers in the United States and in Richburg. I get to visit Richburg on average once or twice a month to discuss the current business, but also where is the business going? And all of this is related to the ongoing sustainability desires in the United States. All of our end uses for our customers at Stein Fibers crave sustainability. It's outdoor furniture, it's in automotive, bed pillows, filtration products, all of our markets and their end customers desire sustainable products for their customers. During the past few years, Mrs. Sun has continued to maintain this top focus of quality at Sun Fibers, but she has also continued the pursuit of third party certifications. This continues to uh, impress and feed the need for companies such as Walmart and Ikea. And it's been a real honor and opportunity for Stein to continue our growth with Sun Fibers as we do meet these market demands together. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Thank Jaron for his regret of not be able to be here, but we still have Robert who will be able to speak to us for um, Stan Fiber as well. And I briefly spoke to Charles before we started and he said he has prepared some comments for us. So let's hear him out first. Okay, uh, well, thank you. And, and thank you so much, the son and the team for having us here. It's an amazing honor. Uh, we've been doing business for over 12 years with your company. And, uh, you know, you said your plant doesn't look beautiful, but I've been to your plant here, plant in China. You guys are doing amazingly beautiful work. So uh, we love that. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a downer today when you hear all of the uh, stuff of what we should and could be doing with sustainability. And there's a lot of great stuff going, but I want everyone to feel just a little bit better, hopefully. If you shop at... Lowe's, Walmart, Home Depot, Petco, Sam's Club, Costco, and you've bought a pet bed or an outdoor cushion in the last few years, you should feel good because you're buying recycled fiber that is uh, 
probably being used and run through the, the Sun Fiber uh, network. So that's what we do, and uh, we're just so honored to be here and uh, share this time with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe Mr. Robert will have something want to say as well. All right. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank Ms. Sun, um, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Um, you know, We've been partners with, with Sun, Sun Fibers and JN Fibers for almost 20 years, as Jaron mentioned. Um, when Ms. Sun first came here and started looking at, at expansion, um, the market was very different. If you go back and look at recycled fibers 20 years ago, consumers, companies talked about it from a cost standpoint. Why are you buying recycled? It's cheaper. <laughs> now, when people look at it, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's what you're helping the environment. Um, the technology and the advances that companies like Sun have done. The recycled fibers now are just as good as virgin fibers. Um, so now you have products that, from a technical standpoint, are equal to their virgin counterparts, but they also help the environment. And you're starting to see that pull from consumers and stuff. Um, you know, supporting companies like Sun, um, supporting the recycling industry, they're bringing new products to this market. Um, it's not something that's a me too product. Um, if you look at the technology and capability that Sun Fibers here in the, has here in the United States, there is no other fiber factory here in the US that makes the products that Sun Fibers makes. Nothing. I mean, there's other recycle fiber companies, but not what Sun produces. Sun's opening up new markets to recycle. It's opening up new demand for goods and it's helping the environment by pulling these goods through. Um, you know, we've worked with Arden for, for many, many years, and, and those type of, of, of programs, you know, are leading us to that. Now, you know, I love these type of events because it brings a group of people together who have ideas. Um, my idea might not solve the problem, but my idea combined with Mrs. Sun's idea or com combined with Charles's idea, I mean, we can solve all kinds of issues. And, and the material is available in the market. The technology is available. We all have to get together to pull it from, from one end of the, the supply chain to the other end. Thank you, thank you. Um, although a lot of those already mentioned in your, in your brief comment, but I still would like to ask, being the leading, the largest distributor, fiber distributor, so you, feel you guys know not just the fiber, some fiber makes. You pretty much know all the fibers and for all those different industries. So we are just wondering if you'll be able to share with our guests today of what kind of trend or is, is it going for the sustainability in the fiber industry in that consumer um, market of yours? And uh, also, what do you think the market opportunity is? You know, I think when you really look back at, at recycled fiber, it really originally filled niches into filling products, things that you weren't being seen on the surface. Um, and, and it was sort of a secondary um, process. Today, there isn't a single market in textiles out there that recycled fibers aren't being pulled forward. Surface fibers, whether it's uh, hygiene products for wipes, um, spinning fibers, apparel. You heard Alistair talk about the apparel companies committing to 45% recycled content um, by 2030. Um, whether it's into, I mean, as Charles mentioned, uh, pet beds, pillows. Um, it is across every spectrum. The, the carpet you're walking under today, uh, it contains 40 or 50% recycled content. So I don't think, I think the, the key thing in the textile industry is it's developed to a point where there's nothing that polyester can't do. Um, it's the most, I mean, it, po plastics get a bad name, um, but, but polyester is sort of unique in that it can be recycled over and over. It, every single end application that's using polyester can use recycled content. So the challenge for all of us is to, to get the consumers to be educated, to let them know it can be recycled, to get the products back out into the market and stuff, and let companies like, like Sun and Arden reprocess that material it, it it helps the cost there's no uh negatives to the end market and it's good for the environment fantastic fantastic and i have a very similar question for charles as well but i think with robert and jaron your focus is on more like uh, 
uh, your customers for like the, the Alden and the other companies who use the fiber, but for Charles, your end customers more close to the mass market, like Walmart and, and yeah. uh, Lowe's and Home Depot. So um, how do you feel those customers, you know, what, what, where do they stand on the sustainability concept and also where are our opportunities? Yeah, I would say it's the number one uh, discussion point with all of the retailers in the U.S. today. Uh, and I would say Walmart and Petco are the leaders of really pushing into this. And there's been a ton of consumer studies done around the interest of the consumer. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been challenging is consumers love it. They don't want to pay more money for it. But it is almost a uh, right of entry now into the market. You've got to have a sustainable solution. And if you walk the retailers, you're starting to see you know, a lot more signage about it, a lot more discussion. And in every discussion with our buyers, it is what are you doing from a sustainable standpoint? So I think it is going to continue aggressively growing in the industry. So how do you, we, we both mentioned here at the very beginning when Recycle ent entered this market, people are only choosing it because of the price, because it used to be cheaper than the virgin product. And how is it going these days? Um, are, we, are we going to be able to charge premiums because of the effort, you know, Mr. mentioned and Alistair as well, all those efforts we had to put in, in the recycle industry? I would just say I think the, the effort that we're focused on is telling the story of what we're doing and why we're doing it and the benefits of it. And, uh, you know, Alistair, the comment you made about, or someone did about the bottle. No, it was Mary about the bottle, you know, gets a, a bad image. But on the flip side, showing the bottle quickly gets a consumer thinking about it. But I think there's a lot more marketing that the retailers and that we have to help them to be able to tell that story quickly to the consumer and uh, that we're not just greenwashing something, but we really are doing something sustainable that will make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this really reflects to the project that we'd like to take off here. We are seriously considering working with NAPCO and the CRA, as well as the Chamber of Commerce to start our own recycling program. We're probably going to choose a few um, feasible spots. They're going to help us to, to see which county or which even state is the best starting point for us. We'll work with the existing waste management to, we will put funding ourselves, almost working as a nonprofit project to um, seriously increase, like significantly increase the recycling rate in the places we are working with. And uh, that's like a part of the education we are trying to push. Yeah, I think we probably ought to think about as we look at our retailers, which one of our retailers do we want to draw in further to this? Do they want to be a hero here? Do they want to be first to market, part of telling the story? Because they have a lot of things they want to talk about in their different communities. Um, and so, yeah, exciting. Yes, we, we'd love to be involved together. If you ever have a chance to maybe talk to Walmart about the programs and some would like to be part of it. All right, thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. And anything, Robert, you would add to? No, I think, uh, you know, one thing is a lot of what we're talking about, we keep talking about bottles. But when you look at polyester, polyester is much bigger than just bottles. That's the easy one. It gets a lot of bad publicity. But when you look at polyester, um, all the garments, the carpet, um, the sheeting, thermal form, strapping, it is uh, film products that Al Alistair mentioned. Um, the recycling opportunities across across this country are limitless on that. Um, you know, China's probably the, the leading um, country in the world on textile and garment recycling. You don't see that in a lot of other regions. There's no other, there's no reason you can't do it. You just have to do it. Um, you've got to set up the infrastructure and, and, and a lot of it goes back to what Alistair mentioned, working with the brand owners in order to design fabrics that can be recycled. Blending cotton and polyester creates all kinds of challenges and stuff. But there are things that you can do. So, you know, those recycled opportunities are across that spectrum. They all help the environment. They all lead into products that, that Sun Fibers and, and Arden and, and Stein can all use in our processes. So I think it's, it's we, we talk a lot about bottles, but it's really the whole industry um, as a whole.
think this is also one of the most important things that we'd like to get out of this type of events. You know, when you get people has the, the power to make a difference together and do the brainstorm and uh, bring up the new ideas and uh, hopefully we will make a difference rather than just sitting together and uh, talking about it. We wanted to, to actually work on it, okay? And uh, I have a quick question for Ms. Sun because she's been, she's done uh, this similar business in both in the Asia market and in the US as well. Um, so Ms. Sun, what, what kind of difference have you ad identified in the recycling industry in those two different areas? 就是亚洲和美洲的就因为你在两个这么大的区域里都在进行这个回收的这个的行业然后就就你自己这么二十多年的经验就是说这两个大区域里你对于这种回收回收行业的一个操作上有有什么样的明显区别 呃，处理领域，然后有使用和就是使用领域这三个点。那我们简单讲，从回收领域上来讲呢，呃，中国因为是目前既有民间驱动型，又有明显的政府驱动型，所以说它整个回收效率是蛮高的。那么在美国呢
就是整个消费。那这一块呢，可能中国反而是弱一点点。呃，然后像 Ireland 这样的一个加，就是说。他直接面对这个消费者的一个产品、产品商、制造商，实际上在推动这一块市场的一个消费上，实际上是有蛮大的一个作用的。Yeah. And, and she wants to add that it's not all negative because she felt at least in the U.S. market, the acceptance level of customers of the Recycled type of product are much higher in the Chinese market. She felt people are actually focusing on the idea rather than just the cost, and they are willing to pay the premium that the, all the companies like us, Arden and Saint Vibenstein, are willing to bring the more the more recycled content to the market. And she also felt companies like Arden are playing a key role as well to push in this idea towards the end the consumer market. Yeah, I think you know this meeting though stimulates the thought of I don't know that we've got enough effort against the the retailers who are really the drivers of、uh, getting this done and helping them understand some of the challenges we face and able to execute what they want. And some of the slides I saw today about the you know the difficulty of the purity of the getting the bottles and all those other things.、Um, we need to do a, I think a better job of educating them. So that they will help drive some of that support, because I think it's a tipping point. With the U.S. consumer is definitely at a different spot than they were a few years ago. This is an important topic, and it's just going to get bigger. And if you look at the industry overall and the changes in the last five years,、um, we have a market here in North America that the limitation for recycling and the environment now is not demand; it's not the end products. There's demand for recycled goods that far outstrip anything that our country's doing to collect it. Whether it's the chemical recycling that that Alistair mentioned, whether it's the programs that we're already doing with Sun and, and with Arden,、um, whether it's the Coke and Pepsi's、um, goals of of 25% recycled content in 2025, 50% in 2030,、um, we're to a point now that the industry is tipped, and it's because of that consumer pull. Companies react because of feedback they're getting from downstream, and that feedback, based on the investments we've seen, and, and even what Sun、uh, mentioned earlier today, is that we want recycled content. So now the demand is there. Our challenges are actually getting the raw materials, the recycled goods, which are in the market. They're going in a landfill. From that point, to those businesses that want it, they're investing. I mean, Eastman's not investing a billion dollars. Um, hoping to run that facility, they want the goods. Well,、um, any of the any more comments from our panelists before we end for the lunch? I know no, you're probably no, looking I, I, forward I, again, to that. <laughs> it's been a great discussion, and I appreciate the chance to、uh, learn and share with you guys. And, and we hope to continue the discussion even after the meeting, after this event as well. Okay. Thank you very much, and、uh, thank you, Miss Sun, and、uh, the Chinese Chamber. And I know our guests might have some questions from all the keynote speakers today, so、uh, most of them will stay for lunch. So any questions you're interested to ask, just go to that specific speaker on that table. They are all open for answers. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>「Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to all our wonderful speakers today. And also special thanks goes to CGTN for the tech support of our today's live streaming online. So now it's time to say goodbye to our guests online and for the guests in this room. Enjoy your lunch, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.」